the budget's coming up in the next um, in the next week, uh, and Labour's response to the budget has been uh, highlighted quite a bit on social media. And I'm not sure if people have seen this clip, but I'm going to play you a clip of a Labour spokesman talking about um, uh, the budget. Look, what we're saying is that this is not the time to consider tax rises. Right, so this is, we're, in the, we're in the middle of an economic crisis, so that's and, and been this is dropped. not the time to do it. So that's been dropped. That is no longer a commitment by the Labour Party or the Labour what, leader. What we're saying is this, this is not the time to do that in the middle of an economic crisis. So we can be really clear from you then, as Shadow Financial Secretary to the Treasury, that you would not support any tax rises at all as the Labour Party right now? In the budget next week, uh, we don't want to see tax rises. This is not the time to do that. OK, well, what happens if, as some speculation suggests, and some sources have suggested to me, that the government is intent on raising corporation tax for the biggest businesses, and there's also a suggestion that they might introduce a windfall tax on some of the companies, perhaps supermarkets, who've done very well in some areas during the pandemic because people have been shopping online. Are you suggesting we'll get to a position where actually the Labour Party would vote against the Conservative Party wanting to put taxes up on business or introduce a windfall tax to help pay for the cost of COVID? Well, let's see what the government put out in, in the budget next week rather than talking but, about hypotheticals. But that's the logical... But, I mean, you've just said it's not time for tax rises, so the implication of that is that Labour would vote against a Conservative government introducing taxes on business to help pay for all the things that you want, like, you know, extra money for kids to catch up. As I say, let's see what the government put out in their budget next week. My point is that what the government should be focusing now is investment in growth and trying to get the economy back on its feet. And if you have, if you have a country where businesses are closing, where people don't have money to spend in the economy, and where you haven't got investment going into public services and infrastructure, that is no way to get the economy back on its feet. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I found that quite amusing because um, it, it's quite categorical saying we're not having any tax rises and then... Uh, Laura Kunzberg, who's obviously not our favourite person, says, uh, well, what, what about the Tories? They're going to put tax rises up. And he says, oh, we'll have to see what, um, <laughs> we'll have to see what the Tories are going to do before we, we do anything. Um, Andrew uh, Fisher, how, how are you doing? What did you think about that interview? Is it a bit of a car crash? It, it wasn't great. And I think the Labour Party's got itself into a bit of a mess on this because they've come up with this line, which is, now is not the time for tax rises, which I'm sure... You know, if you ask most people, you know, is it is now the time for tax rises? Most people think of their basic rate of income tax that they pay. They might think of VAT in the shops and they think of council tax. You know, the taxes we all pay, basically, if we're in work anyway. Um, and people would say, no, now's not the time to do that. I'm struggling. You know, and so it works. The problem is, is when you get to the next level of that, which is, OK, well, what about taxes that don't target that? And this question about is all really about. You know, it's a fundamental thing of economics is is what sucks demand out of the economy um, and tax rises on people you know, that take money out of people's pockets when you're trying to recover. You know, at the moment, we're all locked up soon. We're all going to be let out, you know, hopefully safely. And the pubs will reopen, the shops will reopen in full. And a lot of people, you know, who are you know, middle class, been able to work at home. Um, have saved money on commuting, not buying coffee in the shops and all the rest of it, and I've got money to spend. People, you know, we saw in the newspapers last weekend, you know, this glut of people booking their holidays in the summer with the optimism that they'll be able to go on holiday this year. So there, there is this sort of pent up demand and ta taxing people at this point would be wrong. However, however, let me just say this. If you're talking about the very richest people at the top of the tax bracket, taxing them isn't going to hurt that. If you're talking about taxing capital gains tax, a tax probably none of us on this call are ever going to pay. I've never paid it anyway. Um, I never foresee myself paying it, you know, which is money gained off of shares or second homes or whatever else. You know, again, that doesn't take demand out of the economy because those people have got pots of money anyway, and mostly they save it and evade the taxes with it anyway. If you're talking about corporation tax, again, it's a tax on profits. This is people who are doing well and have made money, companies that have made money. Again, that doesn't suck demand out of the economy. So really what Labour should be doing is talking about demand, talking about that, that thing. So they're right to oppose the council tax rise of 5%, which is going to hit everyone in April. Um, and they, you know, Annalise Dobbs was on Mar this morning setting that out, rightly. Um, but where they've gone wrong is having this blanket line, now is not the time for tax rises. And it appears from some of the briefing, and we don't know until Wednesday whether it's true, Rishi Sunak is going to suggest corporation tax rises is going to suggest even possibly a windfall tax, which is something I've been advocating over the last few weeks. Now, that would be progressive. That would be progressive taxation 
on people who can afford it and a good thing and it would help restructure the economy a bit but we'll see so yeah labor's got it quite wrong on this um for starting from i think the correct position which is trying to be about the demand in the economy and trying to uh you know sort out people you know protect people's finances um but has somehow extended it onto corporation tax which is completely wrong um i'm just uh, grace blakely are you there i am oh right i was wondering if i got the wrong grace um good to see you um what, what do you think about uh, this idea that it's pro austerity to um, to support uh, the uh, tax rise on corporation tax? I mean, this is Paul Mason's uh, view. I've, I've been trying to understand it, but it's not easy for the non-economic literate person I am. Uh, is is it pro austerity to support corporation tax rises? Well, I think, you know, it all really depends on what your view of the term austerity means. Like if you're just thinking about, um, you know, fiscal consolidation in a kind of abstract way, then anything that's going to kind of um, uh, basically kind of shrink the size of the state, uh, whether that means, uh, you know, reduction in taxation or, um, you know, public service cuts could count as austerity. But actually, when we need to, we need to do is look at austerity as a kind of political project as part of a a wider class project. And at that point, you realise that actually when the Tories were slashing public services, they were also giving away um, tax cuts to certain particular groups. And actually, you know, alongside that, um, providing all sorts of various other kind of giveaways to their favoured part of the electorate or capital or whatever. And I think, you know, the problem that we have when we're talking about austerity is that there's this widespread view um, that, you know, neoliberalism and, uh, you know, what the right wants is, uh, is, is a smaller state than the, um, you know, austerity was part of that wider neoliberal project to, to shrink the state. Um, and there's all sorts of kind of, you know, foundations that are provided as to why the, the right would want to do that, because it's about kind of, you know, reducing um, the power of organised labour relative to capital, because it's about kind of um, providing new realms of accumulation. Um, to take place that are outside of the, the orbit of the public sector. But actually, when you look at the history of neoliberalism, again, you know, similarly looking at the history of austerity, looking at the history of neoliberalism, it wasn't actually about shrinking the state. It was about reorienting state power away from supporting one group. So in the post-war period, you know, organised labour and, uh, and, and capital were um, much more, you know, there was a, a more kind of corporatist relationship where everyone would kind of get around the table and bargain. State power in the 70s and 80s was reoriented towards supporting capital. That doesn't mean that the state becomes smaller. It doesn't mean that, you know, what the Conservative Party was focused on was shrinking the state down in this very kind of rigid way, um, as, you know, is often... Um, assumed by their kind of cheerleaders in, uh, in the economics profession. It was actually about using this, this power um, to promote the interests of their backers and, uh, and, and the class coalition that they had constructed in order to kind of underpin their, their power. And what we're seeing today is just is a continuation of that. It's exactly the same thing. Um, you know, what has happened over the course of the pandemic is that the needs of capital have changed. The needs of particular sections of capital have changed in particular ways. And the British state, as it always does, is coming in to make sure that those needs are met. So, you know, we've had billions of pounds being uh, being given away in various forms of grants, but also to much bigger businesses, you know, various forms of, of liquidity from the Bank of England. Um, huge amounts of state support um, have been basically targeted at um, some of the biggest and most powerful businesses um, you know, actually on the planet, uh, often some of these businesses that have received uh, support from the British state. Um, and at the same time, you know, we have a monetary policy being pushed by the Bank of England, which is, I don't think it's controversial to say at this point, directly oriented towards right, increasing asset prices to making sure that stocks, housing, various different asset classes don't fall. Um, because that is, again, about supporting the interests of that wider coalition, which basically for the Conservative Party is a coalition of the top 1% and a portion of the middle class who owns various different forms of assets. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, what the, this is the problem. Labour doesn't, I don't really think that the, um, the Labour Front Bench understands most of this. I think that they're still stuck in this view of, um, you know, uh, everyone thinks that the Labour Party is the party of the big states. Um, and that the right is the party of the small state. So we're going to outflank the right by being even, you know, saying we're going to have an even smaller state than them. 
without realizing that because the right is, you know, following where capital is leading, they're fighting yesterday's battle. And this is what happens when you don't know what you stand for. Um, it's, it's what happens not only when you don't know what you stand for, but when you're not clever enough to be successfully opportunistic. Um, and that is, uh, uh, that is the problem that we're seeing today. I mean, they've basically kind of taken this line, which is you don't raise taxes during a recession. Um, I, I imagine that it was someone's, you know, very clever uh, economics advisor who came up with this line. And um, they've just said, right, this is our line. This is going to make us outflank the Tories. People are going to realise that Labour isn't the party of the big state. All the while, the Conservatives are using state power to support their interests, support their coalition. And actually being clever about it, um, because, you know, the Conservatives are much cleverer about how they uh, kind of build power in various different forms of society and using all the mechanisms that they have at their disposal to achieve that one central aim, which is to, uh, to ensure that they are the ones in power. They're the ones protecting the interests of capital within the British state, although, you know, I'm sure that the Labour Party would do a fine job of protecting the interests of capital within the British state as well. Right. Well, that was a, amazing. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with you. Just, Sorry, uh, I, I it, might it, be speaking too fast. I get overexcited. <laughs> um, so uh, back to Andrew. What, would would you say that um, that that it's a kind of we're being misled by Labour by this kind of uh, non-policy, but also Paul Mason's being a bit kind of misleading by using the word austerity because it's not really about that it's about keeping the as grace would say it's about keeping yeah. the um, money where they want it not um not about yeah. the size of the state yeah. paul mason's completely wrong on that um let's be clear <laughs> um you know let's just put it bluntly you know um but i think there is a there is a bigger oh, question i just because... interrupt you just say i did yeah. invite paul mason to come on uh but he said he's busy I've, i'm sure he's having a good breakfast so um <laughs> carry on well yeah he obviously got a worse offer because there couldn't be a better one but um look, i think i think the important thing here is what labor's not saying instead of getting itself tangled up in this debate on tax rises what it should be doing is talking about what does really suck demand out of the economy which is low pay unemployment low levels of benefits high rents high debt payments you know if you're in debt and having to repay you know whether it's rent arrears or credit card debt or overdrafts then you're not spending money in the economy. You're giving it to banks, which is not productive for the economy. Or you're giving it to your landlord. Again, not productive to the economy. If you're on low pay, you haven't got money to spend. You know, we need to be talking about these things. These are the things that Labour should be talking about. If you've got 4.7 million people furloughed and 2.74 million people already unemployed or virtually unemployed, then again, they are not going to be able to spend money and do this. What you know, it's, it's, I mean, that's one element. And then the bigger question is, and there's this talk and it's come from both sides. You know, Keir Starmer did that speech, you know, a week or two ago now, where he said, this is a 1945 moment. Well, if it's a 1945 moment, then you need to offer solutions on the scale of 1945. You know, the, the war led to the creation of the National Health Service, the social security system, the nationalization of about a third of the British economy. Where is that scale of demand? You know, I mean, a national care service, I think, is one of the important things that should come out of this crisis because we've seen how neglected that was. You know, let's link that back to the original conversation. We know how low paid care workers are. Well, let's boost their wages to commensurate levels in the NHS. You know, let's deal with some of these crises. Let's fill some of the 120,000 vacancies in the care sector, which means a lot of elderly people, a lot of disabled adults aren't getting the care they need not through the fault of the care workers who are there, but because of a lack of capacity and underfunding. So again, all of these things should be being talked about, but they're not. Right. Um, and, and Grace, uh, to, to finish, uh, I saw you had a comp you weren't particularly impressed as well by uh, Keir Starmer's um, speech. Uh, was it, I can't remember, it seemed like a long time ago now, but... Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think um, about Labour's whole uh, po policies on, on everything? I mean, you, you seem to think there's nothing there. Well, I mean, at the moment, there is very little there for the obvious reason that they haven't had to put together a manifesto and they're really kind of holding off on anything to do with policy whilst they try and kind of, you know, introduce Starmer to the public. Um, and I'm not sure they've done a particularly good job of that because I'm pretty, pretty sure that um, very few people actually know really who Keir Starmer is and 
even fewer know what he stands for, given the, the last couple of uh, given the last couple of months or however however long it's been. Um, but you know, in terms of the direction that we're seeing from uh, from um, the current uh, opposition, I'm obviously not particularly pleased because it does just seem, as I said, as though you know this is. Starmer is, you know, has ended up being what we all thought he might end up being, which is just a victory of, of style over substance, but without any style. You know, he's not exactly the most charismatic man in the world, is he? He's not going to be able to kind of hold a room with, like, stirring political oration. He's just quite met. He's like a guy, he's a good haircut in a suit, right? And if he wants to actually come back from and reverse a trend, which, you know, didn't just set in um, last year, but has actually been obvious for the Labour Party for many, many years. You know, actually, if you look at the data decades, which is that working class voters have been turning away from the Labour Party. Generally, they've been turning away from the Labour Party to leave the electorate altogether. So, you know, we've seen this trend really since, you know, the late 1990s of working class voters just exiting the electorate and just not voting um and yeah the the the, re the reduction in the, the franchise being disproportionately um associated with working class voters reduction in the electorate so um yeah i mean that is like a long-standing problem that labor needs to tackle and actually the only time that we saw any reversal around that trend was in 2017 um the fact that you know the lesson that has been learned basically is that everything that was ever done under corbyn was wrong all of those policies were wrong despite the fact that individually when polled, most of them are very, very popular, that Starmer seems to think that the winning strategy is to go back to 2015, when we also lost an election, right? Mm. Because basically there was no kind of uh, no kind of real opposition to, um, to austerity. It's just staggering. I mean, again, you know, it implies that either the people running this show just don't really get what's going on, that they, you know, don't understand the historic moment that we're in, that they don't understand, you know, the voting trends that I've just been talking to you about, or their project isn't actually to win an election. Their project is to consolidate their power of the Labour Party. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, if, if that was the kind of primary aim of a lot of the people who are involved in uh, the return of Starmerism, because that is really, you know, what the right often want to do. They want control of their thing. So, yeah, I mean, we haven't seen much in terms of policy, but I don't, I'm not holding my breath for, you know, a big announcement on the Green Industrial Revolution, which is obviously the kind of, you know, it's just the, the most obvious policy or set of policies that you could, um, you could put forward to the electorate right now, because the two, well, the three things really that you're talking about when you're talking about the Green Industrial Revolution or the Green New Deal are jobs, uh, decarbonisation and reducing inequality. Um, it's, you know, it's not a massive socialist transformation of the way the economy works, that it will make life better for a lot of people, it will create jobs, it will reduce inequality, it will, um, you know, obviously lead to decarbonisation and hopefully whilst doing all of those things it's going to promote the power of organised labour and get us closer to having a society in which we can even imagine such a, a socialist transformation. Um, but I, I'm not holding my breath for anything along those lines. Um, I'm really, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they go into the next election whenever that ends up being with very, very little in terms of policy, just hoping that basically Starmer can continue to market himself as the I'm not Jeremy Corbyn at a time when people will have almost completely forgotten about Jeremy Corbyn because there'll be so many other deep and profound issues that they'll all be dealing with. Um, sorry to be so pessimistic, but That's you know- fine. I'm, No, it's I'm, good to hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, I've got to move on because we, we've yeah. got Jeremy Corbyn on. So and, and he's certainly not. We, we've not forgotten Jeremy Corbyn at all. Uh, so um, thank you, Andrew, as well. Uh, and uh, for coming on again and see, see you. See you soon. Thank you.